Uh, and welcome uh, uh, everyone as well. Uh, and it's also uh, uh, an interesting way of presenting it now completely remotely with all of us. We seem to get, to get used to that, which is kind of strange actually. If you think about it a year ago, it was completely different. Uh, and I joined Shell one and a half year ago, uh, really as a global company uh, flying around. And since March it's completely uh, different and still we are architecting for success. So in this next 30 minutes, I will take you on the, on the journey of where we are uh, and why we are changing all those things. Uh, uh, because as, as you can imagine, it's, it's quite interesting to see what's going on here in uh, HL. Uh, we are in an extremely challenging environment and we have a, uh, uh, an emerging strategy uh, for sustainable success. Uh, I, will, I will take you into that, then I'll take you into our architecture journey, uh, why we started it, where we are now, uh, but also, and that's the last part, is uh, the, the, the key success factors we believe in to be successful from an architecture site and how we create value from uh, with architecture to Shell. Um, so let, let me first dive into a little bit in, in, the, in the world that we all kind of know, but uh, from a shell perspective, the, the coronavirus has a big impact, of course, in, uh, in what we're doing, uh, especially on energy demand. It, 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 it declined dramatically. We have never seen such a decline uh, since the 1920s, actually, in the World War. Uh, and then also uh, we saw the, uh, when the world going in lockdown, uh, it is especially that coal, natural gas and oil, and natural gas and oil are the two main drivers for revenue which Shell are heavily, heavily impacted, uh, which is not uh, very strange. Uh, however, it has a large impact, of course. And now it might, it should work. And in, in the meantime, Shell uh, has uh, revealed, it's called the future of energy. So when you really look at where the future of energy is going, uh, we believe that oil and in the end also gas will, will be not be used anymore. Maybe some competitors of us uh, have different ideas for that. Uh, but we strongly believe in that we are going into the, the energy transition to more renewables where you have more sustainable mobility with electric uh, uh, vehicles, not only the passenger cars, but also the light duty vehicles on uh, flexibility and how you use energy and how you generate energy uh, and how you mix and match all of that and still make money with it. Uh, which is uh, uh, in, a, uh, in a world where Russia and the Saudis actually started off during the Corona uh, uh, pandemic wave one, a, uh, uh, a price war that really dropped the oil price with a decrease in demand. Uh, and that led with Shell to a, uh, logically, uh, of course, to a complete rethinking on where, or, or, uh, uh, what do we do? Uh, what's our strategy here? Um, uh, and that uh, is now uh, uh, in October, it was revealed, we do a, a large program called Reshape. Uh, and Reshape is really, a year ago, no one would have thought that we were in this position. Uh, but we strongly believe, uh, and that didn't change, is that we, that we will make the future and that Shell has a, a particular role in that future of energy in providing our, all our customers with more and clean energy solutions. Uh, and of course, as you all know, uh, uh, at this point in time, not all what we do is that clean with oil and gas. But we have, uh, we really believe that we can do that uh, in a really in a transition, uh, and we can accelerate the transition due to the pandemic and the oil crisis that's currently going on. Um, and when you look at that, how we are believing in that, and we say, okay, look at where we need to grow. On the right side of this picture, it's the growth of the business, is the future of energy, it is in power, it's in hydrogen. Uh, it's in all these renewable energy uh, resources. But in order to go there and in order to finance that on a global scale, we need to fund that with our upstream business, which is basically our oil and refinery business. Um, and then 
uh, as long as we make money there and we generate enough cash, we can transit our business and the entire world into uh, a more integrated gas and chemicals and products into that renewable. But we cannot finance simply the whole energy transition if we would uh, just ditch the upstream business. So it's always a combined version. So you need to have cash first before you can invest, of course, in more renewable. But the oil crisis is not making it easy, but the awareness in our board is, is quite clear. Our strategy is also quite clear. We will do this faster than we have um, thought before. So actually from an energy transition perspective, uh, the current situation and the business, current business climate is uh, uh, actually actually pretty good if you believe in the energy transition. So that means that we believe that we are going to fix the future somehow, uh, but we also strongly believe that that is a data-driven business. Uh, it is it's completely different from a traditional oil and gas where you pump up a lot of oil and gas and you do something smart with it called refinery, etc., and you put it in your car. So we will follow, of course, the, the industry, we will follow the car industry, but most of all, we follow our customers and we try to do that. And what we believe is that data is crucial in that. Uh, and data, luckily, if you're an architect and if you have an IT strategy in your portfolio, then this is, of course, the thing you want to be. Uh, because this all need to be, it's all thriven, uh, or thriven, I should say in good English, uh, by technology, by computers, by software, etc. And if you're an architect, that is, of course, the most beautiful thing to do, because that needs to be architected and designed. Uh, so we believe that digital would transform our entire industry, and Shell has said we will be at the forefront of it. Uh, and, and there are a lot of things we do on digital twins and making things faster and easier to go uh, based on digital solutions and data. Uh, and one of the things we're pretty proud of is that we are together with Microsoft uh, recently announced uh, an, an alliance. Actually, we are the two front runners of that, of a global alliance that help address carbon emissions by creating digital solutions and an open platform for all our customers to have insights in their carbon emissions and then see if, if you have those insights in where all these carbon emissions in the entire value chain from your industry is coming from and in your uh, supply chain, how can we then help based on those insights in reducing the carbon emissions you know, or not only in offsetting them, but really reducing them because it's not good enough to only offset them. Uh, and then the good news is that technology became much faster and cheaper in the last 10 years. And uh, that's, that's what you all know. And you all know that data has grown exponentially in the same period. And that's not only in the entire world, that also uh, counts for Shell. In the last two years, we have created roughly 40% of all the data that we had in Shell. And we are 105 years old or something like that. So we use much more data. We have much more data available not only from internal shell, but also from external. And we want to combine that with uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and that kind of stuff. Uh, if you then look at that, in the meantime, we have to balance all this new stuff where you innovate and differentiate and make money. Uh, and we still have a lot of systems. Uh, mind you, we, at Shell, we roughly have 15,000 15, applications running. Uh, in the IT space as well as in the operational technology space. And that is actually when you, all those core systems, those are stable, all the processes there are extremely stable, needs to be extremely secure because that is our license to operate. So you cannot just come in there with an architecture and uh, hopefully that, that we, oh, we did it agile, uh, very flexible solution. Uh, so let's go to an oil platform in the Gulf of Mexico and see if it's working. If you're not sure that it is adhering to all physical security standards on the oil and gas, it's not a system you can just uh, start to use. So that we need to uh, balance the uh, application landscape we have in the license to operate to secure our operations and add flexible solutions to that. And that's a, 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 it's not by definition, therefore, that we go all the way to Agile, because simply on all those core systems, you can 
very nicely do a waterfall delivery and that needs to be balanced in everything we do. And in the meantime, we see an enormous amount of digital transformation coming up, but we also see there is an enormous gap. And Shell is a technology company. We are a bunch of engineers, or 85,000, uh, which is quite large, uh, but we love to use disruptive technology. So we jump on IoT and artificial intelligence and APIs and event streams and whatever, even on blockchain, we are extremely good and, and far. However, when you want to relate that to our business outcomes, where we want to increase our revenue, reduce our cost, et cetera, there is an enormous gap. And that's where, uh, uh, of course, Gartner always have the hype cycle, but we need to be very keen in where do you use this, this disruptive technology? And is it actually disruptive? Because on the left side, you see here APIs and microservices, et cetera. Uh, and I can remember uh, uh, that's 15 years ago, we already uh, talked about APIs and services and implemented that quite largely at, at my, the company I worked then. So is it all disruptive or is it actually more evolutionary and can you balance that quite well and close the gap in this uh, digital transformation? So what we came up with was a digital delivery playbook. And as you can see here, a lot of agile stuff in it and lean, and, but we're basically from an ideation for discovery, you go to develop and demonstrate and then de deploy, and then it's uh, properly DevOps. And that is more the basis of what we try to do when we deliver stuff. Uh, not always applicable to everything. Uh, as I already said, we still have a lot of waterfall uh, going on but still uh, it is the standard now way of thinking and trying to shape projects and investments. Um, having said that, we had to adapt our architectures to that and that's not the technology side of the house. Yes, of course, we also have to do that, but it's really a journey about the way of working. How do we adapt to that and how can we use the, when you want to go into more digital spaces in an agile way of working, how do you do that? Uh, and if you then see that uh, Shell is an enormous uh, uh, company uh, that is really many lines of businesses, uh, all kinds of substructures, regions, etc. Uh, we have still a kind of traditional demand supply model where the business kind of defines what IT should do. Uh, and that's in a digital uh, uh, transformation, not the, the, the best setup. We have a lot of mergers and acquisitions, joint ventures, uh, non-operated ventures. So we do a lot of things uh, together with partners that have their own systems. Uh, and of course, uh, we need to adopt and the business wants that. We, oh, we do agile, we need to do agile. So architecture several years ago was not really adapting well to that. Uh, it ended up uh, basically more guard keeping than really guiding. And especially in the transformation, you want to have the architects to really guide uh, all these lines of businesses and say, okay, when we, when we go more into platform ways of working, data-driven business, how are you going to do that without architecture? Uh, and then, then they said, yeah, but we work agile. Uh, and then I asked several times these questions, so it means that if you do that, do you still need architecture when you work agile? And most of the time the answer was no, really no, because self-organizing, you don't, actually it means no architecture. Uh, okay, and that's an interesting one because the more agile you work, the more architecture you have to use. Uh, otherwise you go left, right, and all the projects will do, all the self-organizing teams uh, will create their own solution, ending up with a big mess, and then, uh, and actually in the end, ending up with the spaghetti we already used to 12 years ago. Uh, so that's what, what we really need to overcome. And if you then look at how the architecture department was actually working, was really the waterfall way of working, where you do the big uh, upfront design, uh, and then you have several checkpoints behind when in the, the real delivery. And then the agile teams, when we ask them, well, how do you perceive then the architectural involvement? And they said exactly that. So yeah, basically, yeah, we know we have, we, you, you will come up with a big upfront design and we are working agile, so we don't need it. 
Uh, but okay, we know we have to go through the governance hoop. So you create it and then we'll uh, basically nice document. Thank you so much for the signature and then mind your own business. And in the meantime, they just created MVPs and, and all kinds of brilliant applications and more applications and more applications and architects were not involved. Uh, and actually the agile team literally said to the architects, you're not welcome here because when you really look at the architecture way of working and the scrum team, can you point me where's the architect? Even in SAFE, when you go to such large scale uh, agile frameworks, you find architects not in the agile teams, only the system engineers. So we had to break this down because if you end up with that, uh, uh, that's really, this was a joint show one and a half year ago. And after three months, I literally looked like this. So, oh my God, what are we doing here? And a lot of stuff went very well. Uh, and that was because people could find each other and architects uh, pretending not to be an architect joined agile teams. But that's not a structural way of helping a digital transformation in the company. So there was a very clear call to action here that we needed to change this. And, and that is mainly the architecture community that started the change but it's the entire company that you really need to take into account. Uh, because the first question we asked is actually ourselves, what is architecture all about? Uh, it's about alignment. It's about creating insights and ensuring quality. And it's not about the technology. Actually architecture, when you make it simple, it is bringing from a current situation to the desired situation taking into account that you don't spend too much money, that you need to be business agile, but also that you need to have compliance and a resilience built in, and it needs to be secure and that kind of stuff. But it is basically you guide teams from the, where you want to go, from where you are, and then you create a roadmap for that. Instead of prescribing everything, you create a more uh, boundary way of working, uh, giving a lot of freedom to the agile teams, but ensuring that they are moving in the right direction. So do we really still need architecture in agile? Yeah, of course you do. Actually, you need more architecture in agile ways of working, only you do it on a totally different way. It is not only about delivering designs. It is about that an architect really understands what he's talking about, not only from the technology side, it's also that he really understands the, the business side. Why are you implementing a solution? An architect should be able to, uh, to answer that question and translate it in various uh, uh, technology options, because then you can guide the business and the rest of IT in, okay, this is probably the best uh, way of doing stuff. And then you can also challenge the business. It's nice that, you, uh, that your neighbor has a software company with a brilliant solution, but how does it fit? The, because you understand and the technology side and the business and you marry them, uh, you can guide also your business. And strangely, we found out if you do that, that all, actually the business stakeholders are pretty happy with it. And we could improve by applying these ways of working or solution architecture, really better results on the IT side and then the business is actually more happy with it. So if you then look at what we, at the, the traditional way of looking at the architecture depart, department, what we, what we did, we changed that and we are still in the middle of that. But basically what we said, architectural involvement should actually be all over the place in the digital delivery. So when you start, and if you even have an ID, the first thing you do is you, you talk to an architect and, and strangely enough, you will find out he might have ideas, maybe not good ideas, but at least they have ideas. So you shape your project, uh, project and your initiative and architectural involvement should be at all the stages. And the more early you are in this uh, process of delivering IT and digital solutions with an architect, the better guidance you can give and the easier it is to, to develop and to demonstrate and in the end to deploy. And please do not mix up architectural involvement with that it is the department of architecture doing it. 
because if you create the guidelines and reference architectures and design patterns that are good enough, then actually you don't need the architect anymore because it's so crisp clear that these are the boundaries that uh, in the ideation and discover phase, you can leave the agile team just uh, go and they will come automatically come uh, to you and say, okay, I, I would like your, uh, to have your opinion here. And that is where the architecture involvement comes into play. Uh, so the principles we deploy here now in, in of architecting and no matter if it's agile and any other methodology, Architecting is about several things. It's about the decisions that you do. Architecting is not about designs. You, you need to keep a backlog of your architectural concerns and it's all about value. Economic impact determines the focus of what you do as an architect. And you do it with just enough anticipation. It's simple. You need to be one step ahead at least of uh, the project. Because that is, and if you do that, you still can guide them. So we introduce more, we work from intention, and we balance that with emerging. And I will talk about that in a short time. Uh, and you need to be there from start to full delivery. And what, and this, this was already said here in, in the previous, uh, on the main stage here, we believe in capabilities. And capabilities are often only limited to process, organization, uh, data and technology, and we we created more around it because we believe that capabilities on uh, are those are still the heart the process and the organization, the applications, the data. But it's more than that. And what you want to do is to see it in a light of that you have to move integrally from A to B, and you need to think about your resources, about your culture, about your people, about how you control stuff. Uh, but also what is the business model behind it? What are the incentives in it? And what information is used? And you will see if you do that, you will start to think as an architect broader than only the technology. And that is why we introduced it because we believe that capabilities are really the building blocks of a successful organization. Uh, we use capabilities, and that's really the common, uh, the common language what we, uh, what we try to achieve, and that's a critical success for, factor. Um, common language, use of common language in IT and architecting is not limited to IT nor to architects. It is about that you can talk to all your stakeholders because digital is business and IT together. And the tool, and in our case, it's business design, is only enabling it. So you need to be very clear. You do not architect for the sake of architecture or that you want to use a super cool tool. It is you follow the money. Where is the value that you want to create? And that is where architects should focus on. And that includes all the stakeholders also on the business side. And then you have to think about that there is a continuous stream of architectural decisions, no matter if you do it more in a big bang or you do it in a continuous stream of improvements, more the agile way of working, you still need to capture the big upfront designs or you have to think about the continuous stream of architectural decisions you do. And that is actually what the, that's the second question we asked. What does an architect actually do the entire day? Now I'm an architect as well. So actually I could answer this question. And, and basically these are my questions that I, on the left side here, that I constantly ask myself, what is it that the business wants to achieve? And on the other hand, you have to balance that with what IT wants to achieve. Business always wants to go faster, cheaper. Uh, I want to do it myself, et cetera. And IT, and especially in Shell, the case, it needs to be secure, it's a global platform. Uh, so, and you need to balance that and you can only do that and bring that together if you understand on both sides of the house uh, what they want to achieve. Then you can derive the problems from that and the most priority problems you should work on. And then you can go through several options uh, and then you can pick the right one and propose that as the right solution and make it transparent why you choose that. And actually that is the architectural microcycle that you see on the right side. And if you go a little bit more into that microcycle, 
you will see basically what you do as an architect, you identify and prioritize your concerns. So what did you hear on business side? What did you hear on the IT side? You put it on the backlog, you research possible, possible options for that and solutions for it. You decide which is the best fitting solution. And then you go back to your concerns. Does it really adhere to all my concerns? This is what an architect constantly does. So you refine your backlog constantly. And when you decide on a solution, then put that architectural decision somewhere, capture it and publish it. So everyone and all the stakeholders know where you need to go. Uh, and we introduce the idea of value. So architectural principles and practices are really, it's a management discipline around value. And no matter if it's agile or more traditional, it is in, in principle all about balancing what is the benefit of a solution and you combine it with the cost of that solution and the risks it's bringing in. We could introduce the blockchain for the entire supply chain for Shell. That's a pretty high risk, uh, but the benefit potentially could be very high or the costs are extremely high to do that. So the benefit is not outweighed in this case by the cost and the risk. But that is how you look at solutions and how you constantly look at your options that you have and that you have to think of. So having said that, uh, we are on, uh, on the verge of creating success. People recognize what we, what, uh, the, the, change we, we, the change path we are on. Uh, we are, I would say, halfway. The glass for me is always half full. Though I said that the only way up, and there's only the only way is up. Uh, but actually, we're doing pretty okay. Um, and, and sharing that in in the last minutes here is really what what did we do and what did we implement? The traditional architecture focus was really on the operational side of the house and looking at current models, future requirements, and then on the governance. So if you basically you could say, and this is of course extremely black and white, unnuanced, but basically you could say, this is the approach of, if you follow the pro governance process, the outcome is correct. And we all know that's not correct. So we introduced the business outcome driven uh, architects, uh, architectures that really thrive on future state models. What is your dream? Where do you want to go? What is your future state? Can you then analyze and make a good uh, method out of that? But can you analyze what is the difference between you, what, where you want to be, where you are now, and can you bridge that gap? Can you link it to business outcomes? Can you really measure uh, on each solution component that you add? Can you say, okay, this is really adding value to the company? from an IT perspective or a business perspective, preferably both. And can you make it actionable? We are not an ivory tower uh, team. We are, that, that, that's what we were five years ago, something like that, at least that was the perception. But you really need to take the responsibility to make everything and every decision you do, it needs to be actionable by or the business or IT. The second extreme critical success factor is use a common language across 85,000 people uh, and introduce a standard way of working from an architecture side. So we already talked about the capabilities. You see here on the left top, uh, we introduced one language of modeling, it's Argumate, and we strictly follow TOGAF because TOGAF is, besides the fact that every architect should be TOGAF certified. You capture really a vision, the business architecture, uh, then the application and technology layer. And then the beauty is, it is also talking about implementation and migration. So the architectural microcycle is not ending by choosing solutions. It's taking into account, how do I migrate from A to B? Uh, and actually this model is in our biz design, we really use TOGAF as the only way of working. Uh, and if you do that, then everyone starts to understand and link things together. And then you have your requirements nicely in the middle. And we created one flow of architectural deliverables. 
So all the templates we are using or intending to use because we're not fully here yet is it is based on the business model uh, when then and, and the business model contains the market model, the service model, but also the capability model. And the capability model ends up in roadmaps and that can be a, for a complete line of business, but it can also be for a very small uh, solution. And then you put some governance on top of it and you do it all over again, all over again, because you can do this in a feedback loop. Third critical success factor we have is really communicate, communicate, communicate. And we use the golden circle uh, uh, for that, the why, the how, and the what. The why are we doing it? Why do we do architecture? Why do we try to do it with one tool? It is because there is money behind it. And so it's always about value. We do it by, by having a consistent approach, share the story, user-friendly views, and we want to have an integral view to steer the architecture. And we, what we do it with is a tool called Biz Design combined with ServiceNow and Power Designer that we have a set of architectural tools that work together from the as is and the to be. And we have an integral analysis cap capability across the capabilities we have. Uh, so we can provide that and all those options to our stakeholders. Uh, and we did a lot of roadshows and we talked about a lot. We used every media we have and every channel we have in Shell to tell that we really want to have integral analysis capability on a consistent manner with an easy navigation because the opportunity is that you have one single source of architectural truth with this views and this analysis capability. Uh, and we introduced this nice wheel uh, where you can see, okay, how, what, what are the benefits of doing all this? Uh, we make it mandatory for all the architects to use from February on next year. Uh, and then actually my dream is that all those brilliant Word documents we use as high level designs, we can ditch that and we have all the architecture live only in this design. And with one uh, push of the button, actually it could uh, produce the architecture document himself, uh, itself for governance. But if you even, I want to go a step further, I don't want to have those documents anymore, then this design is literally the only approved uh, modeling and all the architectures are in there. And the focus is therefore on analysis. It's not on the designs, the tools and the documents. It's literally about, uh, can we have cool user journeys can we have all these options in there and then you model that and, and capture that in one tool so forget about documents forget about all these brilliant detailed models you all need that but keep it out of sight of all the stakeholders you have because they're probably not interested in it so the horizon layer that was shown here with all the collaboration you can do on the, uh, on, on the appealing models, that is really one trick that is to do the analysis with your business stakeholders much, much better. And then the last one is we really said, uh, we will stop with all the big upfront designs. We will really use uh, the, the combination of intentional architecture and emerging architecture. And that is fully embedded now in our tool set so that you can really see, okay, this is the solution intent. Then you make an MVP. If the MVP is successful, you update your solution intent, uh, and then you literally build your architecture over and over again and detail it out. And that brings me to the conclusion that if you want to build a data-driven energy company, it's literally, it has nothing to do with tools or applications. It's about common business IT language. It is having the capability of holistic value analysis on your total IT landscape. It is about understanding business and IT together and bring it together and guide your business before you start delivering. And it's all about communicating, communicating, communicating. Thank you all very much for your attention. And I hope there will be some time for questions. Thank you, Jeroen, for your inspiring story. Um, yeah, looking at the time, I think we've got the time for um, 
uh, for uh, one question. So, uh, and I tried to combine a few questions uh, coming from, uh, from the participants. So um, to combine a few, um, we would like to, see, to know from you, what do you think are the core capabilities for sales architects? And uh, one suggestion here is, uh, should they be tech driven, business driven or communication driven? What is your opinion how to move to an ideal architect for Shell? Um, that uh, Now I'm going to give a typical architecture ans answer. Uh, it's probably called it all depends. Um, it, it depends on what, 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 your, what, your, what kind of architect you are and what your role is. If your role is, uh, in, in Shell case, it's the segment architect, probably also known as the enterprise architect or domain architect. I think all of the above. But especially with a good focus on understanding the business, do you really understand what processes they use, what data is going on there, and can you translate that into large solution blocks? If you're a technical architect or a data modeler, uh, still you need to understand what is going on in the business. Uh, so, but you, you, your focus is probably a little bit more on data modeling or on data architecting. And the same goes for the cloud architect. But if you uh, and I strongly believe in that. An architect should have always uh, a good understanding of why he is architecting, for what, for what reason, and understanding where value is created in the business. Uh, and if you don't understand that, then basically you are, and, and then the, <laughs> the perception on that architect is, okay, then he is somewhere sitting there in, in a nice, after, behind his desk doing some brilliant designs. That's not how you create impact. Impact is created by understanding what the, uh, the holistic view of processes, data, technology, and how it's working based on value. All right, that's a clear answer. Thank you very much, Jeroen. Um, sorry for the other questions. Uh, based on time, uh, we, we really have to move on to the next uh, session. Yeah, perfect. So let me uh, thank you, Jeroen, for uh, for your answers and your time to prepare and present this to the audience.